Great. Well, thank you for joining. We'll get started here. Thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's session on digital uh, disruption readiness. So first, some, some, uh, some housekeeping before we get started with the content. So all the participants would be in listen-only mode. Uh, you can click on the small box in the top right-hand corner for the full screen mode of, of the slides. Uh, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and please submit uh, questions on, on the bottom. There's a QA icon. Just click on the button there, and uh, we'll go through the questions at the end of the session. And also a copy of the presentation, the recording, will be sent to all of you as well following the webinar. So again, uh, today, uh, welcome. My, uh, my name is Mark Nielsen. I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'd like to introduce you Dave Kreps, and thank you for, for his participation in today's webinar. David? All right. Thanks, Marco, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, perhaps, to, uh, to everyone who's, uh, who's joined us today. Um, looking forward to a, uh, to a good dialogue and, uh, and uh, sharing with you uh, some, of the, um, some of the results of research that we've uh, recently conducted. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is, as Mark has mentioned, my name is David Krebs. Uh, I am um, the practice lead at BDC Research for our enterprise mobility as well as our data capture and automatic identification practice areas. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with BDC Research, we're a full-service independent uh, technology research and advisory firm. Um, and uh, as part of um, sort of our charter, uh, in particular in, in the work that we're doing in the enterprise mobility and data capture space, we're really looking at how uh, mobile and digital technologies uh, are being applied, are being deployed uh, to, uh, to support today's growing uh, mobile workforce and uh, the changes that they're enabling organizations to make in terms of workforce productivity, in terms of customer engagement, uh, and also in terms of um, in terms of uh, new business models. So, uh, really looking forward to uh, to sharing with you uh, you know some of the uh, the findings from this research that we have conducted uh, you know with Stratix uh, over the last uh, couple of months. Great, thanks, David. Uh, we'll jump right into this, and maybe before we we go through some of the details, maybe you can just go through some of the objectives of the research, you know, how, how, did, how did you sample the audience and some of the details around that? Yeah, uh, certainly, Marco. So, so this was an interesting piece of research, uh, a little bit uh, different from uh, projects that, we, um, that we've under, undertaken in the past uh, in that it had a, a much longer term horizon. Uh, so we weren't looking, we were not only looking at um, organizations and their application of, of digital tools uh, today uh, and what makes um, you know, what drives success, uh, but really looking at sort of the next decade, the next 10 years, and uh, the potential for disruption and, and what, uh, you know, organizations should be thinking about as they set themselves up uh, to uh, leverage uh, these technologies and also defend themselves against, uh, you know, potential points of disruption uh, from either current competitors or companies that, you know, haven't even emerged. So, so we're really looking at how organizations are setting themselves up uh, to take advantage of, of digital solutions and, uh, and uh, you know, harness these potentially uh, disruptive uh, organizations. And that's, you know, when, when we say digital and digital disruption, obviously, is, a, you know, we'll start then, you know, spitting out, you know, this laundry list of acronyms. But, but we're talking about, you know, certainly, um, you know, today's sort of, I would say, more mature digital tools in the sense of mobile solutions and mobile applications and, um, the connectivity of those solutions, as well as the impact of uh, next generation solutions such as 5G, certainly such as AI. We, you know, certainly hearing a lot about that. A lot of the discussions that we had referenced AI, and and at the end of the day, what we wanted to to do with this research is to um, is to find sort of the common traits and the characteristics of organizations that best that are best positioned uh, and and have uh, found success uh, in their investments. Uh, and, and then boil that down also from a technology profile perspective, and which technologies are, um, you know, today and then over the next decade, um, you know, best positioned to provide uh, greatest value uh, to organizations. Uh, one of the sort of common themes and threads that, that we, uh, that we um, uh, saw in this research was also about optimization and optimization of investments. 
Um, and we see certainly a lot of investments in digital solutions, uh, but varying degrees of success. Uh, so what is it that allows an organization to optimize those investments? And what does it mean, you know, for them? And then, you know, sort of these notions of being sort of demand aware, being data driven, these were sort of common themes that we, that we heard about in the research as well. Um, and then I think it's also important to talk about labor and, and labor from the standpoint of automation uh, and how, how organizations are, again, optimizing not only IT but also optimizing labor. And labor is such a huge, um, you know, such a huge issue um, uh, and important, you know, requirement still for, for a lot of organizations. Uh, in, both in terms of retaining, but also in terms of training, and, and oftentimes also retraining or reskilling uh, that workforce. So that's another uh, you know element of the of the research that certainly came across. Great. So so to get a little bit more under the covers in terms of you know what we actually did. Um, so there was a uh, you know a fairly robust um, methodology, primary research methodology that we leveraged uh, for this uh, for this particular engagement. Uh, and what that meant was that we uh, conducted some field-based uh, research. So we fielded a survey amongst um, uh, what we would, you know, what we characterize as IT uh, technology decision makers uh, within North American organizations, and that was fielded amongst, I think, about 260, 268 uh, organizations. So the data that you see uh, in this discussion is is driven uh, directly from that uh, from that survey. Um, we wanted to focus on, on really organizations of a certain size, so organizations with at least a thousand employees, um, and so we had a good balance of, of you know, certainly large mid-size and enterprise and large enterprise organizations in our sample. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, we targeted and we, uh, you know, had, uh, you know, had research amongst uh, a broad or diverse set of industries. Uh, so. Uh, we included healthcare organizations, manufacturing organizations, retail organizations, logistics and transportation organizations, um, you know, as part of our, you know, as part of our sample. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure, I mean, one of the key technologies that, you know, we do research in and we were looking at here as well, uh, oftentimes as a, best, as a baseline as well, uh, but, but organizations that were leveraging mobile solutions amongst their, uh, amongst their frontline workforce. Uh, so that was another uh, sort of requirement. And then in addition to, um, in addition to the, the, the surveys that we fielded, uh, or the survey that we fielded, uh, we also conducted a series of in-depth interviews so that we could complement some of the quantitative results with uh, uh, some sort of key or keen uh, qualitative insights. Um, so that's, that's sort of the background of, of what, we, uh, what we did. It was all done. Uh, in uh, mostly, I think, in Q2 um, of of this year. Uh, so this is, you know, very fresh, very current, um, very current research. Great, thanks, David. So, can you maybe share a little bit about the high-level findings that you found out about the organizations and kind of their decision making? Uh, certainly. So, so here I'm going to present, you know, you know, sort of the. Uh, the, the curve that everyone's seen in terms of uh, separating innovators, you know, early adopters from sort of, you know, early majority, late majority, and, and laggards. And, and, and again, one of the things that we were, we were looking to do with this research is, is, is really understand um, what separates, not so much, I guess, from a timing standpoint, but what separates sort of the leaders um, that are really differentiating their, their business, driving competitive advantage uh, as a result of their application of of digital solutions, um, and, and and so what we what we found out, and and the you know the next slide will will, will um, you know will will uh, drive this point home even in in a greater way. But what we find out that that and, and it's perhaps not surprising, um, but it's always interesting to see it you know, res, you know see the results re reveal themselves in the research, but that there is a a, a, a real gap in business performance uh, between organizations that. Are leveraging have been able to leverage uh, digital solutions uh, versus those versus those that haven't. So that that clearly showed up uh, in terms of um, you know in terms of the research. Sort of reinforced uh, that point that uh, you know the, the the of the importance of of the tools and the ability to harness um, you know sort of the, the capabilities of these tools. So so what was it? What were some of the common denominators that we that we saw amongst those? Among those leaders, and we'll go into you know certainly greater detail on all of these points. But uh, 
one thing that, that, that came out that was very interesting from our perspective was one around partnerships. Um, and that there was a clear correlation between organizations that partnered well um, and that identified strategic partners and were able to engage strategic partners to the benefit of their business. Um, so strong partnership engagement was uh, an IT partnership and service partner engagement was a was a key uh, was a key um, a key framework uh, that we saw amongst um, successful organizations. Um, another one, and and again, this is not always uh, you know sometimes the dirty work, but 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 also extremely important is with this pace uh, of a digital disruption, if you will, um, and with this with this. Um, sort of explosion of data that you know we as organizations are, are creating, um, taking advantage and being able to truly leverage that to drive the visibility that you need into your business uh, requires you know a certain level of flexibility in the architecture. And and here we're talking about certainly the constraints of um, some legacy architectures uh, that really didn't enable or allow um, uh, allow the um, you know the benefits of of investments in a variety of these solutions to, uh, to, to come to the fore. So we're talking about, you know, what does that mean or, or setting the table, so to speak, uh, not putting the cart in front of the horse. Um, visibility was, at the end of the day, the nirvana that, that uh, you know, everyone was talking about. Using data to your advantage to have greater visibility and to enable organizations writ large, but, but individuals with organizations specifically, to make decisions in real time at scale. I mean, that, if I really boiled it down, mm -hmm. is, is, um, is, is really what sets, sets apart uh, sort of the leaders versus, versus the laggards. So that, that visibility that, that, uh, that is being created. Um, and then it's also about timing. So at what point does the technology become table stakes, where it's really about cost of doing business versus driving uh, competitive differentiation? Uh, but timing also from the standpoint of uh, we don't want to spend too much time in technology that really isn't commercially viable either. Um, so you did see that a lot with the innovators that were doing a lot of that early work where uh, the ROI might not be that clear yet. Um, and then also another thing that, you know, that we learned as well is the ability to, you know, introduce and deliver new services. Uh, we saw that certainly and have been seeing that, for example, in uh, transportation or field service environments where we're talking about sort of outcomes-based business models. We're starting to really start to see that, uh, that reality, um, uh, you know, that reality occur, uh, you know, within the marketplace today. Right. No, that's great. So can, can you maybe do a little bit deeper dive in innovators and early adopters and what they're kind of doing differently? Sure. So, so again, as I mentioned, you know, the, this slide will sort of uh, reference or evidence some of the um, uh, some of the uh, some of the clear sort of differentiation that we saw in terms of business performance. Um, so the reality is, and we saw that across you know virtually every industry, that you know leading companies are moving quickly, and uh, sort of the laggards uh, may soon find themselves you know uncompetitive. Uh, we 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 did a lot of we have been doing a lot of research in the, in the retail industry and. I'll spend some time talking about, um, you know, retail and, you know, certainly is one of the industries where we've seen, a, you know, a, a lot of disruption. Um, and, and a lot of retailers, you know, we, we talk about, you know, sort of it might be too late. And we've been talking to a lot of retail executives and, and uh, we're talking about timing of, of um, you know, introducing new, you know, new ways of do, doing business. And, uh, and there is, you know, among some of them certainly, a, you know, a sense of we, had, we, we may have missed uh, sort of the opportunity entirely here. So, so, uh, so, so that you know certainly was you know was was pronounced. So again, going going back to the research. So what this, you know, what these statistics show here is that there is a clear correlation between organizations that, um, you know, sort of that best harnessed digital solutions, uh, and things like you know certainly revenue performance, uh, right? So, so the 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 best performing organizations in terms of revenue growth were those that also uh, did best uh, in terms of uh, leveraging digital uh, solutions. Agility was a big one. Um, and here where we saw a, a, lot, of, a lot of separation uh, and, and sort of agility, not only in terms of, uh, you know, 
taking advantage of uh, and, and being able to implement uh, new technologies, uh, but also agility in terms of sort of competitive, competitively being able to respond. Um, and then it, then it really came down to also sort of the optimization of, of those investments and the, and the real ROI uh, behind, uh, behind those investments. Uh, and here we, we certainly saw, and, and we've seen this in other, in other areas as well, but we certainly saw elements of training, uh, a very multidisciplinary approach uh, being critical requirement, a uh, critical uh, uh, requirement. Uh, you know, again, going back to the workforce and reskilling of the workforce, where where we are, for example, introducing automation. Uh, what are we doing with the workforce that might be displaced, and, and how are we taking advantage of of that workforce in maybe a, a higher value adding uh, capacity? Uh, and then also introducing solutions that you know that are also very um, uh, you know very intuitive. Um, so so really, you know, it's you know it's about. Um, you know, starting with the problem and then working your way your way back. And so, you know, one of one of the examples that we saw was in uh, the logistics uh, market. And uh, we talked to um, you know an organization that was, uh, you know, that was supporting um, uh, you know sort of container container based uh, logistics services and, and and organizations that were you know ultimately you know managing you know sort of goods that were traveling around around the world to their end customers. And and what they were seeing today and what they were sharing with us, with us was you know, given the uh, current, you know, sort of impact of the political environment on what it's doing on world trade, um, that has had a direct correlation uh, or has created a situation where there's a less stable inflow and outflow of, of shipping containers. Something that, you know, we don't necessarily take for granted or we think about when we, you know, go out and, and purchase our, you know, next, uh, you know, next pair of, of, of Nikes. Um, and this is, and what this has has, has created was it, it, it led to sort of the costly chore of shipping empty freight container containers uh, for a lot of organizations, which is obviously um, not not optimal, uh, and 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 really is a, a significant cost and a burden to the uh, to these organizations. Um, so what these organizations have been able to do by uh, leveraging AI. They've, they've helped logistics operations navigate some of these problems by predicting how many containers are needed from a shipping line ahead of time, uh, and then helping align uh, sort of em empty containers with opportunities to fill them rather than rather than shipping them you know shipping them empty altogether. So, so by being um, demand you know sort of driven, being more data aware. Uh, or data driven rather, I think organizations are, are, are able to address a very specific issue uh, and this one uh, in this case an issue that would certainly you know you know, you know uh, taking profitability out of their businesses uh, and then apply it in a way in a, in a, in a clever way to, uh, to be more agile uh, so that um, so that they were able in these unpredictable uh, conditions that they were operating in they were able to answer that uh, that level of unpredictability so so again, AI, you know, a technology that you know is certainly holds a lot of, of promise, providing sort of a very real-world um, uh, solution to a to a key problem. Great. And, and and this is again going back to sort of you know, Marco, your question of you know what are what are some of the key ingredients? This is a this is a quote from um, you know from an organization that we uh, you know that we uh, that we uh, talked to as part of this research project, and I'll just read some of this, but uh, or I won't read all of this. But, but what what they saw was you know one of the key uh, you know requirements for success is certainly business support, executive buy-in, um, and and ownership uh, by you know certainly also by non-IT people. If if we're just applying IT. Um, you know, to this it, without necessarily thinking about sort of the business considerations, operational considerations, customer engagement considerations, customer service considerations. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna, you know, the the the, the project is, is is likely is likely to fail, and and oftentimes does fail. Um, so this, in, you know, in this case of this organization, their most successful deployments. Are ones that you know have you know a plant that knows the installation of the new network, and when it's treated uh, not as an IT project but more as a you know in this case they were referring to it as a plant project, um, and and ones that you know have you know clear collaboration uh, you know across you know these you know lines of business uh, in terms of the key stakeholders um, tend to be um, tend to be again 
sometimes it sounds you know sort of very simple, but these are often the steps that that our organizations you know fail to take, and as a, and as a result, you know they might be making or might be thinking about the right technologies and right investments, but again are you know don't realize that that ROI that um, that uh, leaders in their category might be seeing. Right, communication is always key. And then on disruption. Yeah, so, so here, um, I think, you know, when we ask the question outright, you know, what, what level of disruption might they see or tech-led disruption might they see in their industries, I think overall, you know, every, there was a certain level of, um, of, of tension and anticipation across all of the industries. Clearly, no, no industry is immune. Some might be, you know, some might be a little bit more exposed um, exposed than others. So certainly we're seeing disruption through higher degrees of automation. Uh, we're seeing that in logistics. We're seeing that in delivery service. We're seeing that in manufacturing uh, environments. Uh, we're seeing uh, certainly in, in healthcare through telehealth, um, you know, a fair amount of, if you want to call it tech-led uh, disruption. Um, and then also in service industries that really rely on on, on visibility, and, and visibility is so critical uh, to these um, uh, to these to these areas. So this is this is, I think, a great uh, you know point to, to talk a little bit more about perhaps retail because retail is under such huge pressure today um, as a result of um, certainly the um, the emphasis around uh, e-commerce, the emphasis around um, you know changes in 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 shopping habits, and um, and 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 what. You know what we found as a result of the success of uh, of e-commerce, and, and you know I think it's important to note also that when you're looking at spend today, e-commerce really is is still you know only 15% of actual retail spend. 85% is still in uh, what you would consider sort of a more traditional physical uh, retail facility, uh, but that the shopping journey uh, certainly starts uh, in a digital capacity, oftentimes probably 60-70% of the time. That might lead uh, the shopper to enter um, enter the store, but shoppers are certainly looking for uh, more flexibility, more more options, more visibility, um, and and that has led a lot of retail organizations, traditional retail organizations, to you know we've heard this you know term omni-channel, multi-channel, omni-commerce type of capabilities, and one of the realizations of that uh, has been uh, concepts like you know click. Click and collect, or you know, buy in line and pick up in store, um, and 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 we've certainly seen successful uh, deployments of that, where an individual can purchase something online, and it might just be easier to go to a smart locker in a store or or pick up the item in the store. So the stores themselves have transformed into more of a fulfillment role as opposed to the traditional retail role. Now, taking that or peeling that back a little bit. To be able to do that well, however, uh, goes at the heart of what at one one of the biggest challenges that retailers have today, and that's real you know real time visibility, accurate visibility of where items are within uh, you know within their operations. It's not only good enough to know that you have one of those items within your store; you need to know how many, uh, where they are, uh, and so we saw a lot of organizations, a lot of retailers, sort of. You know, have a knee-jerk reaction and rush out and deploy click-and-collect solutions, and, or you know, buy online, pick up in-store solutions, without that visibility, uh, without really thinking through, okay, when the customer arrives at the store to pick up an item that they had ordered online, what's that workflow look like? If they need help, who's providing that help? Uh, is there a dedicated area? Um, and and uh, you know, how is that being designed? Is it in the back of the store? Or are we you know, bring it to the front of the store. So, you know, we, we found that the, 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 the a number of sort of operational channels, but challenges, but also visibility challenges, led to a significant difference uh, in success of, of those initiatives to where orders were fulfilled, you know, within, you know, less than 30 minutes of making the order online for very successful buy online, pick up in store uh, examples, to those missing by 13, 14, 15 hours. Uh, the targeted um, uh, sort of deadline of, of the product being available or the item being available. And, and so again, you know, it goes back to do I have the right infrastructure, do I have the right data to be able to take advantage of um, some of these next generation digital solutions and digital services. 
Um, and, and, that's, and that's really where I think, again, the risk profile comes into play um, uh, in, in terms of really being able to drive ROI uh, a, a, as a result of some of these investments. Right. No, that, that's very interesting, David. Um, you know, on the Stranix side, in, in our business, we're also seeing a lot of, a, lot of uh, a whole surge around the quick service restaurant vertical where they're really taking steps to use technology uh, to be more competitive um, with other competitors and, and really using technology to increase their, their product, you know, production, to increase customer, customer satisfaction. We've been seeing line busting happening at quick service restaurants and their ROI can be really quickly achieved with using the right devices and the, and the right form factors. Um, so disruption is really real for them in their vertical today too. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. So um, we're moving into our first poll. So let me kick this off and launch this one. So uh, the first question is, which industry do you think is at greater risk of technology-led disruption? And we have uh, five different choices in this, in this poll. So uh, the first one is healthcare. Uh, the second one is manufacturing and then transportation logistics, retail, and then, you know, the last one is energy and utilities. Um, and we'll, we'll see, we're, we're already getting some results in here that you can then view once I end the poll, we can look at that. So we've got a, quite a number of, oh, well, retail just went up a few tads there. So we're getting some results in for that. So I think it shifted a little bit, so I'm going to end this so we can look at that. I'll share the results here. So you guys can see that. So we have a very high number of retail. Um, you know, people think that that's definitely prime for disruption that we're, we're just talking about here. Uh, and then healthcare manufacturing and transportation logistics is right behind that too. Um, so that, that's yeah, I mean, I think that's in the marketplace. not surprising to me at all, uh, to, at all, Mark. I mean, I think certainly we, we, we you know, the, it seems like the, the headlines of, of uh, you know, today's business journals, um, you know, talking yep. about sort of the demise of retail uh, every day. I think a lot of that, to a certain extent, is a little bit overblown, but, but certainly retail is transforming and is changing, and, and retailers that, you know, are able to um, transform and, and, you know, there are, you know, many examples of, of retailers, traditional brick and mortar retailers that that have been successful with their digital initiatives um, and, yeah. and have found success in balancing uh, physical infrastructure as well as um, as well as uh, as well as um, uh, their uh, their di digital channels. Uh, but yep. but as I said before, I mean we were talking to many executives and often oftentimes they feel like it's almost too late uh, for, for, for a lot of them and, and sort of that, you know, the ship has sailed. So there's a, there's a very, you know, sort of nervous, nervousness around there, uh, in terms of how to best, uh, cause we saw, you know, one of the things that we, we, we certainly saw in, in, in the retail space is how do I, you know, certainly we want to introduce, you know, digital options to my, you know, customers and, 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 and optimize digital channels and, and, and integrate them with their physical. But, but it's really about also, you know, leveraging sort of the physical infrastructure uh, that they have in place and, and providing, you know, sort of positive experiences uh, there. So, Mark, think, why don't you, yeah, jump to... Yeah, so, you think we talk about verticals, yeah. Yeah, so, so this was, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, on the, on the flip side in terms of, of the rate of innovation uh, by, you know, by industry based on, you know, based on the research that we had conducted. And, and I think it's interesting to look at the inverse here because in, re in this case, retail, um, you do have a, a, a growing separation between the, ha the haves and the have-nots. Um, and, and I think that that's where, you know, that's why retail just shows, uh, shows up where it does show up. Um, so you have some very, you know, some organizations that are, are certainly driving, um, you know, a lot of innovation. Uh, but then you have, you know, a lot of a lot of organizations that are still stuck in, you know, retail from 10, 10 20 years ago. Uh, healthcare is is one where we're seeing, um, you know, it's an interesting one. It's obviously one that's bound by a lot of, um, you know, security and privacy, um, you know, requirements. Uh, unlike, or maybe probably even not unlike others, but but it's also one where, you know, the cost of care, um, quality of care. I mean, healthcare organizations are increasingly looking at, you know, sort of hospitality uh, or taking cues from the hospitality industry 
um, to um, you know to differentiate, uh, and that has everything to do with you know everything from their arrival and their experience checking in to um, the services that are provided during their quote unquote stay or the patient's quote unquote stay, and and um, and then also the ability to uh, you know to uh, you know to um, uh, limit the need to, you know, come into a physical office, be it a physician's office or, or oftentimes the, um, you know, the, the hospital itself. So, you know, home care and telehealth uh, capabilities right. that leverage, um, you know, mobile solutions um, is is increasingly uh, increasingly common and and you know avoids avoids you know the trips and and also reduces the cost for uh, service providers. So. So we're certainly seeing that, and you know, in transportation logistics as well. I mean, this is really where we've seen probably automation have its greatest impact, and the and the notion of um, you know lights out warehousing is you know increasingly uh, you know a theme that we you know that we hear about, and um, sort of autonomous and collaborative rot robotics uh, to manage you know manage materials, and uh, we're starting to see you know hear about you know self-driving. Uh, you know vehicles as well. So, so I think that that area will will certainly see a you know a fair amount of uh, disruption and and sort of business case or technology innovation. Right. And I know you talked a little bit about the data, the data driven and kind of and, and demands around that. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more too. Um, yeah. So what does it mean to be data driven and demand aware? I mean, again, those were sort of the themes that that we heard about sort of successful, um, you know, successful organization. So, so a couple of points here um, that, I, that I'd like to make. Uh, one which was a, an interesting one from our perspective from the research. So, so again, as I had mentioned when I opened up uh, that, you know, we were looking at organizations that were also leveraging mobile uh, solutions since, you know, when we're thinking about digital disruption, mobile, uh, mobile tools, mobile applications. Uh, you know, was you know one of the early areas where where organizations were you know were were leveraging to, you know, be more productive, to engage better with customers, um, uh, and and uh, you know make decisions you know, or have access to information where you need it when you when you need it, so you can you know have that sort of scalable decision making. Um, so we've seen a lot of a lot of benefits from their investments in mobile solutions. What we are now seeing is that these organizations. Are relying again going back to the partnership comment a little bit, but are relying on um, on uh, third-party mobile managed service providers. Uh, or we found a, a strong correlation between the most successful um, you know organizations in terms of their application and investment and optimization of IT, uh, and those that also leveraged uh, mobile managed services uh, for their mobile estates. Um, and and I think there are a couple of reasons for this um, uh, in, in thinking a little bit about it. One is prioritization, knowing what you're good at and leaving, you know, I'll have another slide of, uh, later on this, but, but, but being able to, to, to uh, let, you know, sort of the experts do uh, the work of the experts. And, and around mobility, mobility is always tough. Um, there's so much change happening, life cycle management, um, you know, monitoring, uh, you know, the mobile devices, the performance of these devices, and making sure that, you know, we are, you know, operating at or near to, um, uh, maximum uptime, uptime because you know whenever things go down, there's disruption that that uh, you know that happens. So I think that um, organizations that have leveraged managed services to support uh, their mobile estates um, have um, have certainly um, uh, have certainly um, uh, you know been able to offset uh, some of that um, you know some of those uh, some of those challenge some of those challenges. Um, you know, another you know another area that we're certainly seeing um, you know a lot uh, more attention to. Um, it's been a buzzword for a while, but I think the conversation has shifted. Is is certainly around um, is around IoT and and sort of connectivity. Um, and 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 here I'll sort of provide an anecdote from in this case an oil and gas company. So oil and gas is a you know an industry which I would consider very technology averse. Certainly, I think ripe for disruption, but for oil and gas organizations, um, they're they're very very uh, sort of deliberate, uh, and they they think with it they the time frames that they think of when they're when they're rolling out you know technology solutions or making investments, they really are thinking about infrastructure for the next 10 years, uh, so they have very long you know very long term horizons. 
So in the, in the case of this, of this organization, about five years ago, they started to look at IoT. It was a, you know, a big buzzword. Um, and they thought it would be sort of an easy plug and play um, you know, interaction. And, and while they found that IoT systems in general or providing connectivity to uh, some of their infrastructure in general was, was reliable, their systems, uh, their legacy systems um, made what they thought would be a, a one-year project uh, and they turned it into about a five-year project. And, and, and what they realized is they needed enterprise-level control of everything, and they had to build out the system to control that, uh, and, and sort of the, you know, the bridge that allows their systems and their software to talk uh, to, these, uh, to these edge devices. So the back-end system now, in this case, is, is able to take every edge device, create the database of everything that happens on these IoT devices, and then automatically starts you know, painting a picture of the process with this data which all goes back to the operator, uh, and they, they can see what they're making on the assets, what they spend, and, you know, over the course of the li lifetime. And it helps, you know, identify failure, uh, and they can collect, uh, you know, just, just about, you know, data on everything um, um, that they, um, you know, that they need. So, so while they started with some of the sort of lower hanging fruits, um, now that they've, you know, got their feet worked, so, so to speak, uh, they're looking at sort of that next uh, you know, that next um, uh, level. So they started out with, you know, looking at monitoring blowout preventers, uh, which is, you know, incident monitoring in highly regulatory environments, so like when hydraulic valves might fail. Um, and, and now they're starting to, you know, to, to expand that uh, as, as we, you know, as they introduce, you know, new levels of reliability and regulatory compliance. So again, so, so this is sort of an example of some of the time frames that are happening, not only because of the, the sector and the pace at which they move, uh, but also some of the changes that they need to, they need to make uh, to be able to leverage uh, leverage some of these solutions and really benefit from those investments. Right. No. I, so, in our business at Stratix, we, we're also working with a large, um, fast, casual restaurant uh, chain who's who's using data to really drive next uh, next things around their environment too. So. They can pinpoint failures in the mobile devices out there. They can see the usage of the devices, the revenue stream coming from them, the locations. Uh, they can really use a lot of this data to really drive uh, the next steps and really drive uh, the right synergies with their business and their customers too. So Absolutely. we definitely see that as well. So uh, moving along here, so it's time for our next poll. So let me start that one up. Poll number two. So poll number two, um, is your organization currently working with a managed mobility solution provider? Um, so four, quite, four answers for this one. Yes, currently working with an MMS partner. No, but active, actively looking at them. No or don't know if you're working with a managed mobility solution provider today. So we have a couple, couple votes coming in already. Let's give it a few more seconds here and see. So we have a couple answers in there. So I'm going to end this right now. We can look at those answers. I'll share those back. So right now it's no, but actively uh, looking at them and don't know is the top two there. So we'll definitely. Yeah, so, so again, this is, you know, it's, it's not surprising, you know, to me. I mean, I think that um, organizations and uh, you know, they and, and and again, maybe we can jump to the next slide, Mark, and we can talk about sort of partnerships. But um, you know, I think the point, you know, the point that we found here is uh, is about sort of marrying or managing a sort of internal capabilities and and you know, applying uh, sort of those capabilities to the um, you know the problems that are best, you know. You know, best position to uh, to support, uh, and then um, and then knowing you know when to partner. So in the case of mobile manage management, I th and and um, uh, sort of uh, managed mobility, uh, if you will, I think there's a combination of two things going on here. I think one is within organizations. I think mobility has uh, you know has also matured to the point, um, and and the services that are being wrapped around them through managed service providers. Uh, you know, really, the, and the efficiency, uh, uh, you know, that that creates, 
uh, and the value add services that are layered on top of it. Again, going back to visibility, uh, going back to um, uh, sort of analytics around the performance of, of devices and applications. Uh, that's that's where I think that you know that uh, has um, ha that has such a close correlation between ROI and, and optimization. Uh, because I think you know, the, the point here is about uptime for mobility, where, where we have found organizations that really are relying on these mobile solutions to, again, inform decisions for a service technician that's sitting under the wing on an airplane, or you know, help a retail associate um, you know, figure out information about you know, inventory availability in real time or you know, you know, transact a, you know, a sale. If that device doesn't work, uh, or isn't performing optimally uh, when they need it, that can lead certainly to disruption of the workflow, certainly to a loss of productivity, but, but also to oftentimes a, a very bad customer experience. Uh, so lost revenue, lost loyalty, right. uh, et cetera. Um, so I think that that's where that connection shows up uh, in terms of uh, our, you know, performance of organizations and, and leverage of, of you know, robust management capabilities. So I think that that ties to you know other areas as well, and this this uh, you know this introduces sort of that you know that one takeaway that we found amongst um, sort of you know leaders slash innovators uh, is is knowing what they're good at and and sort of leaving up leaving the rest of the experts. So using partnerships uh, to build uh, and new skills, introduce new services uh, is is significant. Um, and, and again, oftentimes it's just internal skills gaps. Uh, internal, you know, sort of, um, sort of capabilities, um, uh, and, but all, you know, a lot of times it's also introducing, uh, introducing newer technologies into, into, you know, into their environments. Uh, and then another thing that we found was, okay, what does it mean to be successful, uh, you know, with a partnership strategy, and what does a successful partner look like? Uh, and then one thing that we found here um, that was striking. Uh, but when we think about it, when we take a step back, perhaps not too alarming, but I think very important, is the level of expertise that the partners showed, uh, you know, within the organizations or within the industries that they were supporting, especially when it came to, um, you know, when it came to some of these uh, sort of digital or next generation digital solutions. So I, I want to work with someone who really, uh, you know, maybe doesn't know my business per se, but knows what it means to be a QSR or knows what it means to be uh, to work in the oil and gas or energy and utilities industries, or knows what it means to, um, um, you know, to do, um, you know, logistics or, you know, delivery services. Uh, and, and speaking that vernacular, uh, I think, is a, is a huge or has been a huge differentiator uh, in terms of driving successful partnerships. Oh, that's great. But I think, you know, the quote on the next page sort of, again, provides some, uh, you know, some evidence that effect, um, and and again, I, I'm not going to read the entire quote. Um, uh, you can look at it when you guys you know receive the deck. Uh, but but again, it, it sort of talks about um, marrying sort of capabilities or the lack of capabilities with uh, with partners. So the availability of partners that can help with the implementation because they lack the internal expertise. Um, they want a partner that also has a network of partners, uh, so they can really take take advantage of that network effect. Um, uh, of 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 these organizations, so I think that that is um, you know certainly a key uh, you know a key uh, uh, a key requirement. No, that's great. And you know, uh, Stratix here we have we have several customers, a uh, large grocery chain that we work with. That you know, with 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 them, they can call us. We can replace their devices. We can help them with help desk services and really make sure that their their staff is is uh, up and running with these devices. And that also takes the burden off their IT staff. Um, so they can focus on other other subjects, uh, looking at new projects, looking at new 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 solutions, and doing some R and D instead of instead of um, doing all the all the day to day stuff. Um, and that's definitely something that we can assist customers with and fulfill that need. So so looking a little bit further out, um, you know, today versus 2030. You know, what, what are some of the technologies and how do organizations really need to, need to set, themselves, um, self, set themselves up for success? Sure. Um, so, so, so here, again, we were looking at um, the impact of certain technologies, you know, currently um, and, and sort of uh, and moving forward. And, 
and what it means uh, in terms of uh, skill sets and building these you know, new skill sets, how are we filling these gaps. So, so certainly, uh, I mean, cybersecurity, I think, goes without saying. I mean, any, any digital project today uh, has to have, you know, from day one, uh, a certain level of um, you know cybersecurity elements uh, to to it. I think the the amount of data and and the sensitivity of some of that data uh, that is being managed um, through these uh, through these solutions is, is is certainly evidence of, of of ensuring that. I think we're we're seeing a lot of emphasis today on 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 certainly developing the infrastructure that we talked about. You know we've seen a lot of movement of core applications into the cloud. Uh, we're going to continue to see that to drive certain uh, levels of flexibility. Again, not all applications, uh, but certainly areas certainly like you know CRM is an obvious one, HR systems, etc. So we're starting to see that roll out. I think mobility as a as a as, as a strategic differentiator is is I think it's still is you know we still are seeing significant opportunity uh, for for introducing mobile solutions. Uh, and that will continue to be a driver moving forward. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit longer term outlook, uh, we're starting to, you know, certainly see IoT and, and AI especially, uh, you know, start to, um, uh, start to uh, take, take shape. And, you know, they, there's a healthcare organization that we talked to in, in, in speaking about AI and speaking about timing. And, you know, they were thinking about implementing uh, AI, but they weren't exactly sure how to use it. Uh, and, you know, they were going also through a, a transition to a new patient record system, uh, and they thought that may, they might be able to leverage AI there for patient care and research. Um, and, and, and they had a situation where they had, you know, tons of data, uh, but, they, but they really weren't fully utilizing it or they weren't, uh, you know, using it to their advantage. Uh, at the same time, they've been moving, you know, to the cloud, you know, for the past couple of years, uh, and the idea was that once that was all transitioned, uh, they were able to better integrate and connect and leverage uh, the data even better. So they have about 200 applications that were not integrated previously um, that they were working on on getting them integrated because that was a, a huge a huge issue. But they you know they went on to say that you know today AI optimization is is probably on a scale of one to five is probably at a zero, <laughs> and if, you know from a timing perspective, um, and and they're getting close and they're interested. But again, they're, the infrastructure is shifting you know, slowly um, and, you know, when it does come, it will be sort of an enterprise-wide as opposed to a facility-specific adoption, um, starting with a couple of sort of apps, starting with a couple of disciplines, uh, and then, and then, uh, and then, you know, moving, you know, moving, moving out. So mostly probably administrative initially, you know, sort of monitoring, um, you know, the number and the types of diagnoses and doing things like scheduling, uh, and then, evolving into, uh, you know, sort of more medical research and uh, sort of advancement sides. Uh, so again, sort of a very, I, I would say, sort of um, structured, you know, approach and, and one that sort of, you know, suggests that, you know, we're just starting, um, you know, we're just starting to, uh, to be able to take advantage of, of sort of these, these harness these, you know, advantage, um, uh, you know, especially in the context of this, you know, particular healthcare, uh, you know, organization that realized we need to get our infrastructure, we need to get our apps in order first before we can, you know, do any of this. Otherwise, it's just more and more data that really isn't uh, yielding any any results. Another example, a little bit different. Um, and this was um, this was with a, a uh, an energy organization that was managing crews on on their oil rigs, um, and 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 this is sort of the the uh, sort of references uh, sort of the example of of sort of the data that we're seeing on the right hand side of the slide here about building new skill sets and upscaling and training the existing workforce is probably the area where where organizations can can uh, take greatest advantage or have greatest advantage so in the case of this this energy organization the rig crews are you know they used to be paid for physical labor for their physical labor uh, but now you know they're seeing that they require more and more technical pro proficiency um, and the crews just have to become more sophisticated because they're doing more technical management of equipment um, and, and, you know, in addition to, you know, needing new skill sets around sort of certainly data, data sciences, um, and the size of a crew that will be required to maintain a rig, they anticipate that shrinking as a result of automation, but they will still have people, you know, in each existing position, just fewer of them, uh, and they're just going to have to have a different, you know, di a different type of, of capability uh, in terms of what they'll be doing from a day-to-day -day, uh, perspective. So, so, again, organizations really need to think about um, you know their their workforce and what they're doing to skill or upskill or retrain their existing workforce 
certainly we can always hire new people. We can acquire uh, talent through acquisitions and, and also leverage partnerships to, um, to, fill, in, uh, to fill in those gaps. Uh, but this is an area where we, we we're certainly seeing, um, I think, again, you know, the best performing organizations, you know, be, be ahead of the curve, uh, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, with it, when it comes to their digital projects. Well, that's great information. This is all great stuff. David, thank you so much for, for sharing all this information with us here. Um, yes. So... Just to just to talk a little bit about Stratix here. So we're we're a sponsor of this research with VDC and David. We're a managed mobility services provider, or we're the largest pure play provider in the U.S. today with over two million devices, and and we can really provide strategy and services uh, that innovators can lean on. So we can share information, best practices uh, in different verticals, uh, and really assist with that. Uh, we can also work both with uh, IT and business teams to really create the proper, you know, out-of-box experience for the end users. Uh, so when they get that mobile device, when they get that um, the endpoint device, they can really see productivity right off, right off when they open the device and turn it on, uh, and it's really maximized when they have these new project deployments. And after the project has been deployed and new devices have been shipped out, or even with existing devices, we can really uh, assist and augment with personal, personalized uh, day two mobile support. So offloading IT tasks uh, so the IT, the IT teams can really focus on, on, on their true revenue generating projects they need to focus on. Um, and likewise, we're, we're really experts in the mobility ecosystem. So from everything from procurement, you know, choosing the right form factors of the devices, uh, right mounts, uh, how they should be used, uh, mobile operating systems, uh, large deployments, small deployments, and really support around that. So device management and uh, also asset management. Uh, so really getting that data around what these devices are doing and where they are. So we can really be the one hand to shake uh, to really ensure that your organization can really be a, a true innovator. So we had a couple questions come in. Um, so let's go through those. So I got one here, David. If if my business is one of the, one of the slower tech adoption groups, are there any first steps they should take to improve our standing? Yeah, I mean, I, again, um, I think there are there are uh, I, I think there are certain things that that, that I think organizations uh, you know can can do to um, to, uh, to 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 uh, put themselves in a better position. Uh, to uh, be more successful with um, and uh, you know drive greater value out of their out of their, out of their IT investments um, and, and or digital investments rather, I think you know w one of the most important uh, aspects and, and and this you know applies you know across certainly any of the these technologies uh, and their varying levels of maturity, um, but 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 it always has to start with sort of a business problem in terms of what we're trying to solve here. Uh, as to um, you know, and, and you know, certainly you have labs, and you have you know, you're testing you know new new technologies as they come around. But but it, but in the sense of you know, what is what is the challenge uh, for my for my organization? Is it you know it, you know are we increasing you know the number of errors in in fulfillment, or have we seen an increase as we've shifted to item ba item based fulfillment? Um, you know, is it is it you know a customer erosion problem or a customer engagement problem? Uh, you know that that we're seeing. So, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, needs to you know sort of needs to be clearly identified and defined. Um, I think you know internally within an organization, uh, executive buy-in uh, for any of these initiatives is a must, um, and and you need an executive sponsor to to have success with these uh, with these programs. Uh, we've seen we've certainly uh, you know we've certainly uh, you know seen many many uh, you know deployments fail just because they didn't have the internal. Uh, you know, internal support that they required, and that also means not necessarily that you have to go create the center of excellence, and then you have all of these, you know, all of these, um, you know, sort of policies and structures in place. But, but, but there is certainly something to be said about uh, engaging, you know, both sides of the aisle, so to speak, in terms of IT and ops, uh, and and making sure that you know both see eye to eye in terms of what what um, sort of the uh, the stated. Uh, the plan is and and the and the target problem that we're looking to solve and sort of the approach that we're looking to take. Um, you know the other you know the other part I think you know in, in, to a certain extent is know what you're good at but also know what you're not good at and when you when you identify what you're not good at try to find you know again partners or or consultants or you know even hire people 
uh, to fill those uh, to fill those skills gaps. Um, and and I think that you know that undertaking you know for a lot of organizations is you know maybe a little bit sobering, uh, but I think is also a very honest assessment in terms of uh, you know in terms of sort of their capabilities and setting themselves up for success uh, yep. moving uh, moving forward. So another question uh, came in. Does does these companies, uh, manufacturing, retail, healthcare, face a challenge in managing multiple 3PLs? Um, do these companies, I mean, we didn't test that specifically um, yeah. in, in, the, in the case of, uh, you know, in the case of sort of these discussions or this research. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, managing, you know, anytime when you're, when you're thinking about sort of logistics, uh, networks and 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 uh, working with third-party logistics providers uh, to support your um, your your requirements, um, and then finding yourself in a situation where you have uh, more than one to manage, uh, it certainly adds complexity uh, to this. And you know sometimes um, you know you you end up with that situation as a result of maybe M and A. You're acquiring a company that has their own partner. Maybe you have that to fill sort of regional uh, gaps. Maybe you have that to you know to fill. Uh, you know certain other uh, certain other gaps. Um, so I think that you know it is important to again, you know now here I'm 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 standing on my soapbox talking about partnership and effective partnership strategies. Um, it's also possible to have ineffective partnership strategies where it becomes unwieldy to manage all of those relationships. Uh, so so you know sometimes um, you know sometimes it's also important to, to you know to make sure that. Uh, we aren't, you know, we aren't partnering with too many companies, and and where we might have anticipated, um, you know, anticipated some benefits, uh, you know, those aren't necessarily being realized as a result of again having these sort of disparate systems. Uh, so, you know, having more than one partner to do the same thing oftentimes uh, introduces a lot of challenge to the uh, to an organization. Right. Just a few minutes left here. We got one last question, David. Um, is there any technologies that a company should avoid? Unless they're already ahead of their tech adoption and and mobility maturity curve. Um, I mean, there are certainly you know the technologies that we were looking at. Uh, a, a, there are certainly you know varying levels of of of, of maturity, um, and and right now, um, it, you know, when we think about you know things like. Um, 5G even, uh, you know, which is still very, very early on, but we're starting to see some interesting uh, use cases emerge even in these industrial environments around, you know, introducing 5G for, you know, large campus-based networks um, and, and being able to manage those in a much more cost-efficient way, but also being able to introduce uh, a level of, of, of throughput. But, but clearly 5G is, is in its very early stages, so I would yeah, say, I would agree, yeah. you know, it's good to test. Uh, you know, with that, and, and to test out, um, you know, sort of value propositions. Uh, but, but I think the technology, in, in and of itself, is is today too immature um, uh, for um, you know for real you know real world uh, deployments. Uh, I think uh, artificial intelligence technology is 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 um, uh, is becoming uh, you know certainly uh, you know much more imp impactful. I think you know, we certainly also looked at you know wearable uh, technology. I think there are certain areas where it makes a ton of sense. And adds a ton of value, uh, especially mm -hmm. around sort of hands-free operations. Uh, other areas where it's just uh, you know the technology is 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 too immature. So you know especially I, we found so with some of the glass uh, technology, um, sort of some of the technical limitations in terms of battery power, uh, in terms of uh, sort of robustness of the platform. It's just the technology is not quite there yet. The value of uh, you know what you know what some of these yeah. AR and mixed reality overlays. Um, uh, are, are providing is is, is 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 fun to test, but it just really doesn't have that real world um, you know value yet. So I think you know th there certainly are areas where I would take a, a you know a certain wait and see approach. Yeah, no, that's great, David. Uh, thank you so much for your time, David. Uh, thank you for everybody on on the phone here with us. We'll, we'll send out um, the recording and the slides out to everyone. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.